Um, hello, everyone. Welcome to Citizens for Global Solutions, World Citizen Book Club. Today is Saturday, September 14th. I'm filling in for James May as your moderator today. I'm Drea Bergman, Director of Programs. So I'm pleased to see you all here today and welcome. If this is your first time and you would like to be kept informed about upcoming book club sessions, please drop a message in the chat and we will add you to our group email. Uh, today, we begin with the book, The Idealist, Wendell Wilkie's Wartime Quest to Build One World by Dr. Samuel Ziff. And today is the first of two sessions with Samuel. Uh, I will introduce Samuel in a few moments for his opening remarks, but first I'll just take a few minutes to go over our housekeeping as usual. Uh, we are recording today's session and the video will be available on CGS's YouTube channel mid next week. So Samuel will make a, a brief introduction, 10 to 15 minutes, with the intention to allow more time for questions and a conversation. So there should be enough time for at least a couple of rounds of questions this week. And I will ask everyone to keep their questions or comments to two minutes per, per person, per round, uh, so that everyone has a chance to uh, participate. And if you exceed your time, I will interject and ask you to wrap up. Uh, does anyone object to the community agreement for the Q&A? Okay, good. Uh, as usual for the Q&A portion, you can raise your hands virtually or physically, or you can put your questions in the chat box at any time. And I will come to you on a first come first serve basis. As usual, we'll stop around the 10 minute mark uh, for the end of the session, so around 1.20, for any announcements people may wish to make about relevant events or things they want to promote. I know, um, Rebecca, I will ask you to talk about the Action Day for some of the future and our hybrid event next Friday. Um, so I'll put that those links in the chat as well. Uh, and then we'll also share a survey with you in the chat to collect your feedback uh, that we'll start doing at the end of every session so that we continue to engage, offer engaging books and foster vibrant discussions with our authors. Uh, so with housekeeping out of the way, it is now my pleasure to introduce our guest author for today, Samuel Zip, the author of today's book, The Idealist, Wendell Wilkie's Wartime Quest to Build One World. Samuel is a cultural and urban historian at Brown University. He has written for the New York Times, the Washington Post, N Plus One, The Baffler, and The Nation, and is the author of the Manhattan Projects, The Rise and Fall of Urban Renewal, Cold War, New York. He also co-edited a collection of the writings of Jane Jacobs. Today is session one of Samuel's book. And so with that, I hand that over to you, Samuel. Thank you so much, Drea. I appreciate it. Can everyone hear me? Is it good to go? Good. Great. Excellent. Thanks, Drea. Um, and thanks to, to Rebecca and to um, everyone at CGS um, for your interest in this book over a, a couple of years now. Um, I'm really pleased by the way that uh, it's found an audience of people who um, are interested in these questions and interested in the long tail of the moment that I sought to capture in my history uh, surrounding Wendell Wilkie. Um, so thanks a lot again, just for the, just for the chance to come and talk to you all today and talk with you all today, really. And that's what I really want to make uh, make sure we understand. I, I'm not going to treat this as a, a book talk. I'm not going to uh, sort of give a big long spiel about the book. Um, you will have read parts of it, and Andrea, as I understand, we're we're sort of focusing on the first what uh, chapter up through chapter five or something today. That's right. We're doing, or do I have that all wrong in my head? The book, I, no, through chapter eight, right? Because we're doing through the Russia section, right? So we're going up to page 172, you said. Great, chapter eight. Forget how my book is structured. Um, so what, what I'll do is I'll just give a sort of informal introduction to where this book comes from for me, uh, in some sense, a personal story. And as I'm sure that many of you, many of you listening to this call will know something about this history, uh, will have learned more about it reading the book, and um, <clears throat> many of you will be experts in ways that I am not on the contemporary politics surrounding these kinds of questions, as you were just discussing, um, in, in, in trying to get uh, various sorts of um, 
forms of the of the kinds of politics that Wendy Wendell Wilkie represented uh, accepted around the world today in our own governments or at the UN and places like that. And I am certainly not um, uh, up on all of those uh, those connections to today. So I'll be interested to hear from many of you how that strikes you. But let me just give you a sense of where this comes from for a couple minutes. Um, there's probably a couple different ways to tell the, the story of how this book arrives uh, for me. Um, as as uh, Drea's introduction suggested, I am not really uh, a historian of American foreign relations or a historian of um, the United States and its uh, international relations as is, is usually sort of sectioned off and professionalized in the academy. I begin my work and my thinking about U.S. history and U.S. culture and politics as an interdisciplinary scholar in, in, in American studies. Um, and I began that interest in a history and interest in cities. Um, but I, I guess, so one location for this, one location for the beginnings of the project begin in New York, uh, when I lived in New York more than 20 years ago. And on, I think, a very familiar day for all of us, uh, for all of us who are on this call, um, we all remember this day very well. And it's the obvious one, September 11th, 2001, right? Literally just uh, past that anniversary a day or two ago. Um, that was a obviously very impactful day uh, for, for many, an incredibly transformative day for many people um, in all kinds of ways we could talk about. But let me just focus on the ways that it was for me. Um, and how in some sense that day in some ways leads to this book, although that that, that path is not direct. Um, I was uh, a graduate student in those years and living in New York. And um, I was on the morning of September 11th, 2001, um, just getting out of bed when I heard a very large boom uh, cross down out somewhere in the world outside my apartment. I lived in Brooklyn, um, not far from the east, from the from the river and not far from, from lower Manhattan. And uh, I thought it was something else. Um, I thought it was something happening on the street outside my door or down the street. Um, to make a long story short, we understood very quickly that something had changed. Something had, uh, this tragedy that had befallen this kind of act of transformative violence had reordered, I think, the politics of the city we lived in and also the world we lived in in a certain kind of way. Now, in, in, in a certain way, this was not unexpected to me. As, as I said, I was a graduate student in American studies. I had been a student of U.S. history for, I don't know, a decade or more at that point, um, in some sense, uh, going back to my undergrad days. And I had some sense of the ways that uh, we could analyze the power of uh, the forces that got us to that day, September 11th, um, and particularly the forces of the power of American empire and its power to shape the world in the 50 to 60 to 70 to 80 years after World War II. But I don't think I fully understood yet, or e even if we still do today, all the cross-cutting currents that would bring us to a day like that. Um, and so that led me, as along with a lot of people of my generation, um, to try to understand the place of the United States in the world. This was already something that people in my world, in American studies, in the study of U.S. history, were already trying to do in a certain kind of way. Um, and I had, in some sense, not been a part of that. I had been sort of sitting aside of it, although I had become interested in it in my studies of the built environment of New York City, which I was working on in those years as a dissertation, or just getting started on in those years as a dissertation. Um, I was thinking about the ways that the uh, built environment of New York City had been transformed largely by the policies of urban renewal and modernist uh, visions of transforming the landscape. And that was the, my first book that that uh, Drea referred to, uh, Manhattan Projects. Um, and so as I, as I lived in New York in those days and lived in the aftermath of the destruction of the World Trade Center, um, part of what I began was thinking about was the destruction of these particular built environments. At the same time that on the side and around this all over, I was trying to understand this longer history of America's involvement, imperial power, um, unequal involvement in the rest of the world, things that all of you are familiar with in so many different ways. And um, one of the things that I began to be interested in as I wrote was, or as I thought and as I researched, was the ways that forms of 
uh, relationship to the larger world made their way into people's everyday lives. And the way that I became interested in that in New York was in the building of particular spaces. So the obvious thing would have been to try and go and tell a history of the fake, the making and unmaking and destroying of the World Trade Center, um, as it was the sort of iconic vision of American power in the post-war era. And that's the reason those terrorists targeted it, of course. Um, I shied away from that for a number of reasons, although it's a fascinating story. Uh, it was already has already been told in some sense in some pretty good books. If anyone's read Eric Darton's really good book about the World Trade Center, it tells this story in interesting and literary ways. Um, but I settled on a different place. Um, and that place was a place you all are familiar with and are, are looking to go in the next few weeks, and that's the United Nations. Um, so I became interested in the uh, spatial and built and urban history of the United Nations. And that became uh, a chapter in my book, uh, in my dissertation in my book, and thinking about how is it that this place comes to root and ground in New York City, imagines itself as an international space, a place outside the bounds of the United States, but also becomes a very powerful symbolic space in the, in the cityscape of New York City. Um, and as I worked on that and thought about that, and we'll go into all the details on that, but uh, I began to be interested in a particular kind of um, sentiment, a kind of uh, a vision of what that place meant um, and what the, what the World Trade, excuse me, what the United Nations meant to people in the immediate uh, aftermath of its building in the late 1940s. Uh, and I got interested in a particular kind of, uh, I'm trying to think about how to say this, a kind of particular um, sort of essentially a literary form, which was essays and arguments and speeches and people who saw the United Nations as an emblem of a potential transformation of the United States' role in the world um, as the, the possible symbol of a renewed uh, and more equitable view of the United States' role in the world. And this was particularly strong in the middle of World War II and in the first few years after World War II, right? In the years before the Cold War entirely coalesces. Uh, and so this, the, the United Nations sits at the beginning of my book about uh, of Manhattan projects, about the, the remaking of uh, the space of Manhattan um, under urban renewal policies that I argue have something to do with the dawning, the, the making of, of a sort of Cold War vision of space. So the UN sits there at the beginning of that story as a, as a place of possibility, an imagination of, of renewing and transforming um, this, the nation's disposition towards the rest of the world. Um, and I particularly became interested in people who wrote about it in that way. And one of the first people to, uh, that I discovered was a sort of unlike, what I thought was an unlikely person to be a, a interested in this. And this was the essayist, the New Yorker columnist um, and famous writer. Uh, E.B. White, who I thought of as a kind of essayist about, uh, you know, an essayist about the everyday life of New York City and the author of sort of famous children's books. Now, some of you may remember that he also, in The New Yorker in those years, um, wrote a series of um, of essays and little blurbs and things, often in the sort of that talk of the town section at the front of The New Yorker, about world government. He was particularly fascinated with world government. And in 1946, he published a book called The Wild Flag uh, that was compiled these essays about world government. And now it turned out that E.B. White, like E.B. White in all things, was not a particularly um, committed evangelist for this idea. Um, in some ways, he was quite ambivalent about it, which interested me, but also meant that I think that this was a sort of side track for him. So I wrote some things about that. But I became interested in this genre of writing and this kind, these kinds of people, sort of well-known Americans who, who, who endorsed or in other, were, in other ways um, explored the idea of, of a transformed disposition and a more interdependent view of the United States' role of the world. And the, obviously it became clear to me that the person who was the most famous and most uh, well-known during that period exponent of this idea was Wendell Wilkie. And I already knew something about Wilkie and I knew something about One World just he, as he crops up in the uh, the histories of the sort of home front of World War II, right? That he uh, appears as a kind of, um, for some, a very idealistic figure uh, uh, and for some, a sort of tragic figure, somebody who comes ar around, uh, offers a, a kind of challenge to American ideals and, and American visions and American, uh, 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 the sort of, uh, 
pragmatic tone of American life during the war when most Americans were interested in just winning the war and getting out. Um, and he launches this one world vision. Um, and so I thought that this story was perhaps not as well told as it probably as it needed to be, and that there might be some more um, a larger uh, sort of backdrop or sort of larger canvas for this story than we had previously seen in the the kind of limited uh, takes on this that kind of brushed Wilkie out of the way very quickly and reduced him to some not quite a footnote but perhaps not an active part of what happened during these years during and just after World War II. Um, and, and, and so I became interested in that because it seemed to me that there were a lot of these people um, and they were involved in various different levels of American life in, in different ways. And that they, their, the tradition of their political and cultural thinking had been somewhat lost, had been sort of somewhat uh, buried. And there's lots of reasons for that, of course. The Cold War is the main one, right, in the way that all of you will be familiar with. The way the Cold War very much straightened or narrowed our ability to think in in various, uh, in, in co more complex ways about the, the fate of the United States or the, the role of the United States in the world. Um, and then there was the other way that it was narrowed, which was in some sense that most people just saw Wendell Wilkie in the end as somebody who ran for president in 1940 and was kind of uh, a failed presidential bid, a part of a, a, a kind of weird moment in the history of the Republican Party, which is something always fun to talk about, the sort of lost liberal republicanism. Um, and that kind of um, a story of an also ran, a person who kind of shows up in American politics and then quickly disappears. Um, and, and he had featured in many stories like that too. But I wanted to capture this moment in between those two moments, in between 1940 and say 1947, 48, 49, when the Cold War is really coalescing. What happens in this moment uh, what happens to shape Americans' uh, understandings of the world and what happens uh, that this vision that Wilkie imagines doesn't coalesce and kind of goes back under the, uh, under the, under the water, so to speak. Um, so in some sense, as I say in the book, if this is a history of, of a failure, but of a productive failure, of something that leaves a residue and leaves a kind of um, group, uh, a, a set of resources, of intellectual and cultural resources, for other people to take up and for and for people to hang on to right for people who like all of you in this in, in this organization who have counted these ideas for many years and have felt these to be powerful and important ideas in reorganizing uh in, in, with hopeful with the hope of reorganizing um our thinking around this set of problems um so so that's one thing and, and it's also a and a sort of side note on this, it may be perhaps in the professional world that I inhabit in American studies and U.S. history in those years and since, uh, there's been a very important and powerful story told about um, about uh, people on the left who are anti-imperialists, who date, who we used to think of dating their history to the 1960s, and we began to date their history to the 1940s, um, and even before in some sense, but... Um, but this is one moment where they have a flourishing chance to tell a different story about American involvement in the world, um, and mostly uh, coalescing around the candidacy of Henry Wallace uh, for, for the presidency uh, after uh, FDR leaves him aside in 1943 and 44. Um, and I wanted to bring out a slightly different tradition, um, a different, slightly different tradition that is not necessarily on the on the left, on the radical left, but in sort of more in the centrist middle, a sort of liberal left tradition, which I think was in some ways a uh, more powerful tradition at the time, but has been somewhat forgotten um, and touched more people, reached more people than perhaps the radical left one, although this was although people like Wendell Wilkie were were educated by people on the radical left, were educated by um, by uh, folks involved in, in the internationalist side of the civil rights movement and the, 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 uh, the, the, the movement for black freedom uh, and places and the labor movement and places like that. So I was interested in the way those kinds of energies, which have gotten a lot of writing, professional writing in American studies and US history, actually made their way into mainstream debates for a moment in the middle of the 1940s in and around the founding of the United Nations. But how Wilkie inhabited a kind of more progressive vision, say, than the New Dealers, and the the forces around Roosevelt, who found who wanted to envision a kind of very American uh, centric view of internationalism in this period, that led, of course, to the Cold War. So it's kind of like staking out uh, a, a, an interesting snaking path between all the available options that we really understand, and to try to recover this alternative vision and this alternative political culture 
that thrived for a certain amount of time and, and took up uh, and, and won the allegiances of a great deal of American people for uh, of the American people for quite uh, for, for a delimited window or a, um, a sort of a rising and falling window, I guess we might say, um, during this period. So I became this I became quite interested in this period and it became uh, clear that what the best way to do this would be to try to tell a story based off of a narrative history of Wendell Wilkie's trip around the world and the reception of his book. So today we'll talk a lot about the big, um, who Wendell Wilkie was, where he came from, uh, and the first part of his trip uh, up through Russia. And then next week, next time I'm here, I guess it's in about a month, we can, we can talk more about the reception of this trip around the world. So this is a story of, of the United States in a lot of ways. And even though it's about a number of places around the world, and that actually ended up being one of the most fascinating and maybe perhaps frustrating things about reading, about writing this book, which is that I had to learn a lot about a bunch of places around the world, uh, which frustrating in the sense that it just is hard to do um, and needs attention and needs time and needs dedication. And that's an important part of this, um, uh, part of the story that I that I ended up setting out to tell. But in the end, the book is about how Wendell Wilkie uses that frame and is uh, is opened up by that experience and attempts to use that experience to shift uh, the uh, sentiments and the feelings and the political dispositions of his countrymen to try to transform their view of the world. Um, so that's the arc of, uh, of the book in that sense. Um, this was a this is in some sense a book about uh, the emergence of a certain kind of idea. And let me just say one more thing about that, which is this idea that um, at this moment in American politics and American culture, there was space for an alternative view of the United States' role in the world that didn't just um, that didn't just align with the, the sort of two-part structure that we've been given in histories of American foreign policy to think about how people relate to the rest of the world. And those two usual the two usual poles are sort of idealism and realism, um, right? And my sense is that I that uh, Wilkie is another kind of thinker and that there was a role uh, to uh, think about global interdependence, a kind of universalist vision of that, which is perhaps not uh, apt for our times, but was at the time a vision of a universalist idea of interdependency that was different from the idealist vision of uh, in the technical term, and I'll say a little bit more about the title in a second of the book, um, uh, that, that imagined spreading American style democracy around the world. And then the realist idea that said, we need to spread American interests. We need to, to act from American interests. Wilkie's vision is a different one of using a kind of um, inter the interdependent uh, uh, conditions of the world that resulted in the formation of the United Nations, driving that forward and using American power to contest the role of empire around the world, using it to criticize America's own imperial formations and to abandon them, and to uh, and to as we'll talk about some today, I hope um, to try to hopefully. Uh, head off what Wilkie could see was the dawning of what would become the Cold War by trying to make uh, a better relations with the Soviet Union um, in order to hopefully usher in that uh, the 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 world of an independent, more equitable, decolonized world. Um, so that's the the sort of vision of that. Um, some of that doesn't uh, jibe too much with the title of the book. I originally had wanted to call this book No Distant Places, which is one of Wilkie's most evocative phrases, uh, this uh, sense that everything is being um, pulled closer together. This was the way he talked about it in one world. Um, my publisher had other ideas. Um, and the idealist, I think, is meant to capture the sense that this is a, a person with an ambivalent and um, far-reaching view of the world who's whose idealism is both admirable and fascinating, uh, but also whose idealism didn't uh, survive. Uh, and so we have, uh, as publishers like to do, a, capa a more capacious uh, title. Although I thought No Distant Places was a really capacious and uh, far-reaching title, but this is this is where we stand. So it, it, I wanted to make clear for folks that this is not meant to evoke the uh, professional foreign policy uh, position of idealism, but to evoke a different kind um, and more sort of humanistic version of idealism. Um, so, you know, that's, a, I think that's a, that's one way to kind of give you a sense of where the, I think I've talked enough and that's, that's one way to give you a sense of the way the, the book unfurled, where it came from, where it was going. Um, and I'd love to, to hear uh, people's reactions and thoughts about 
about about the book. And I would love to talk about particular passages or particular sections of the book or particular uh, moments or scenes in the book, if folks are interested in that or anything that anything that everybody wants to talk about, I'd be happy to 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 do so. Thanks for uh, for listening. Oh, and by the way, I mentioned forgot to mention at the beginning. Please do call me Sandy. That's what I go by. Uh, S A N D Y, and that's uh, that's my that's my the way to call me. So I'm happy to hear from from anyone and, and everyone. Thanks so much for joining me. Thank you, Sandy. Um, so let's open it up to to a conversation. And again, you can raise your virtual hands. You can raise your physical hands. I have a question I for Sandy. Suzanne. I see Suzanne. I see Winston too. Winston. Yeah. Winston, you're off mute. Did you want to go first? Oh, I did not. Uh... I can hear you. You're good. You can hear me. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Uh, thank you. I um, I'm particularly. Uh, uh, delighted to hear you finding some correspondence between your interdisciplinarity uh, to which you were exposed early in your academic life and um, Wilkie's uh, uh, discovery that there are not so many borders after all. And perhaps they are not uh, um, particularly uh, the best for consideration of our, of our common future. But, but I, I wondered, I thought your proposed title to the book, No Distant Places, was would be far more consistent with <laughs> what you developed with us this, this, this afternoon um, than the idealist, uh, especially uh, because it has so much pairing with uh, realism and might be a bit confusing to the reader. So uh, could you could you, could you say a little more about uh, how you sought to correct uh, this in the content of the book? Mm -hmm. Sure, yeah. Um... It's funny because that title came along at the very end. <laughs> the, the, the idealist came along at the very end when I think the publisher decided that it was going to be harder to sell the book uh, with, the, with the title No Distant Places, that people thought that would not mean anything to some people. Um, I think you all are re really well placed and, and, and the kinds of uh, a group who would have who would have purchased it, who would appreciate that title. I think that um, what I try to do in the book is to position Wendell Wilkie as a uh, a unique but not unpre uh, unprecedented figure um, in this period. And I think that he's unique in the sense of the ways that he was able to reach this massive audience with a, a view of the world that did not conform uh, to pre-generated ideas about the world. But he's he, the ideas are not entirely his own, right? They're shared by a lot of different people who are trying to work their way out of older forms of um, American uh, chauvinism about the world, let's say, and even chauvinism within traditions that pretended, or not pretended, pretended is the wrong word, but which uh, claimed to be um, internationalist and, and, um, and equitable to use our, 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 our language today. So in a lot of the ways that Wilkie has been seen in the past uh, is that he's essentially seen as a, as a, as a sort of World War II version of, of Woodrow Wilson. He's sort of seen as a Wilsonian internationalist, just mm -hmm. sort of continuing that tradition. So one of the things that I wanted to do was show the way that he departs from Wilson. Now, in the first part of the book, if you've read right, he is a Wilsonian as a young man. In the teens and 20s, he's first inspired by Wilson's, um, the, the familiar story we have of Wilson going to the peace in 1919 and trying to create the League of Nations, right? This story, uh, unfortunately, I think has 
um, in, in the way that it's told in a larger public sphere has kind of devolved as many American stories do into a story of American exceptionalism. Um, and this is another, that's another side note about trying to tell the story of World War II through this book in a, in a less American exceptionalist light that I can come back to. Uh, but I think newer histories of the, the peace process at Versailles, the end of World War I have shown that a lot of the reason that the Versailles peace process was uh, troubled from the very beginning is that it was unable to confront the power of European empire. And that those uh, from the quote unquote global periphery who arrived in Paris to try to petition uh, Wilson for a more equitable future found themselves stymied. This was not something that uh, many Americans were even aware of at all. It took uh, the only Americans who tended to be aware of it were those who were interested in critiquing American, uh, the, the beginnings of American imperial power in, in the Pacific and the Caribbean, um, and African Americans who, like W.B. Du Bois, who also was quite involved in the, in, in the uh, political organizing around this period. Wilkie, I think, was probably not even aware of all this, just uh, sort of saw, Wil uh, saw Wilson as a, as a, a political figure who um, he admired. He was very young at that time. He was, I think, uh, trying to remember the exact where he was exactly. Uh, he well, he had fought. At the, he had been part of the, the military at the end of World War One, and I think he observed the Paris peace process, or at least the beginnings of it, from a posting in Par in in France, not in Paris, but in France. Uh, and then afterwards, as he became part of, he was actually as as, as readers of the book will know, he was a Democrat, um, uh, not a Republican at first, uh, in most of his life, <laughs> in fact. Um, he was a Wilsonian, um, but dur but it's this trip in the 1940s around the world and to view the kind of periphery of American uh, of American involvement and, and, and European involvement in the world that I think helps him divorce him from that older Wilsonian idealism that imagines the United States as just a kind of font of democracy that will be spread around the world um, and, and teaches him really that the United States has a lot to learn from the dream, the uh, aspirations, visions, and um, and political consciousness of people who have lived under various forms of colonization for for many years, and this launches a real, real struggle for him to understand the history of American colon, uh, colonial power and American imperial power uh, that he's still on a journey on when he's when he's uh, when he dies in 1944. Uh, but it's it, this is really opened up for him by. I talk about several different forces that do this. Um, one of which is uh, one of which is simply is the trip. The trip is where it all comes together. But there are sort of some sort of tendrils leading to the trip, and one of those is is, is his friendship with Walter White of the NAACP, um, who has a kind of internationalist position for the middle, the sort of middle liberal grounds of the civil rights, uh, what was becoming the civil rights movement in those years. Um, he's quite uh, a, uh, in contact with a lot of American journalists. Um, who who are beginning to articulate a kind of internationalist um, and sometimes anti-imperial position in this period uh, in the 1920s and 30s. There was a very a couple of very good books about this, uh, about this generation of American journalists um, by the historian Nancy Cott and the historian Deborah Cohen in recent years. Uh, some of these folks are friends of Wilkie's once he becomes, uh, once he begins to run for office. Um, and some of them, and, and Joe Barnes, who comes on the trip with him and is a character in this book, is one of these people too. So I think that's kind of a way to see where he's starting to divorce himself. This is all, of course, before the idealist, realist uh, kind of binary gets solidified, which is a kind of product of the post-war yeah. rise of the Cold War, professionalization of, of foreign policy in the Cold War. And he's this sort of, I wanted us all to be able to see him as this moment before those things had become these fixed poles. And we could imagine that you could get out of Wilsonianism into something different that didn't just have to be um, realism or idealism. So that's that's one way of thinking. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Winston, for that question. And I wanted to jump over to Suzanne, who had your uh, physical hand up, and then we'll go to Joseph and then Emma. So okay. Suzanne? Thank you. Thank you. Well, first of all, I want to say I, I am fascinated by your book, and I have not, uh, must admit, I have not read the 172 pages, <laughs> but I have very intensely read what I read. And um, 
I have a lot of uh, comments, and I want to make the one that relates very much to what you said last, and that is, um, you say that uh, um, he in the forty two uh, he traveled and uh, he he went on this journey, but there was resistance in 42 in France, in Germany, against fascism. And these groups were not little, but they were not recognized here very much in the United States. And when they were recognized, they were recognized uh, with people like Eugene Debs and with uh, on the left. And I think there was a failure in the US uh, to uh, recognize and support some of uh, these movements. And th that was repeated in the independence struggle of the Africans. And uh, you can see that in uh, that uh, uh, <clears throat> he talks about when he comes to Sudan and, and he uh, uh, comes to Egypt. And uh, it, for 42, only in 60, the first uh, African countries become politically independent. It was then a short time, but there was many resistance movements, many independence movement, movements that would have followed his idea of interconnectedness. Mm -hmm. And my question is, have you followed that trail? Uh, have there been? Uh, that's one question. Uh, yeah. I have many more, but one that relates mm -hmm. to that one okay. is also, um, I happened to be in Egypt when uh, Nasser, uh, Gamil Abdel Nasser, uh, 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 nationalized the Suez Canal. And it was France and England uh, and Britain and uh, uh, to some extent Israel that were in ownership and control of the Suez Canal. Yeah. That would have been a fantastic moment. It was the time of Cold War, but it would have been a moment for uh, the United States to intervene on behalf of Egypt. So uh, there, are, there are many connections that I see. And again, I, I love the way that you tell the story and that you connect to all of this and make us have more thoughts, new thoughts. And I hope next time when I've read all the book, <laughs> uh, I have uh, many more questions. Well, thank great. you in the meantime for well, this e you. exciting book. I appreciate it, Suzanne. Hey, Sandy, oh, before you respond, just a little yeah. housekeeping note. Uh, many yeah. of us are old friends on this call, but um, for those who don't know each other, it would be wonderful. We have so many eminent friends, um, new and old, if you could introduce yourselves. Um, so Suzanne and, and Dr. Langley, um, if you maybe just wanted to put in the chat um, so we don't hold up more, more time, um, a little bit about yourselves. We're so delighted to have you with us and, and anybody else who um, comes uh, in to intervene or orally, maybe if you could just say a word about who you are and where you're coming to us from. Mm -hmm. Sorry, Sandy, thanks so much. No, that's great. It's always good to hear, you know, how people, what people's perspective on this and what their expertise is. And I, I'm, I'm, of course, know that many people involved with CGS have great expertise far beyond mine on so many of these things. I'm seeing in the chat, all these things I know nothing about <laughs> and that I would be educated on by you guys. Um, Suzanne, I just will, I'll just say, uh, I, um, I think what's, what you're picking up on in, in your reading of this is that, that Wilkie is, uh, is, Wilkie is being educated by the people you're, you're talking about in this period. This is, this is a story of his re-education, right? He, as I said earlier, a second ago, there, 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 the tendrils of these things, but a lot of the realization happens as he travels. And I think a lot of that happens in the Middle East, in Southwest Asia, as we say today, um, starting in Egypt. And you'll see if you get through the Egypt section where he start, I, 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 I narrate some of how he starts to be like, wait, this seems strange here. This seems like there's a whole group of people here that I admire. He, he's, he gets very interested in um, Bernard Montgomery, the, the British ger uh, general who, you know, he, he, he uh, observes the, the, uh, the Battle of El Alamein and is there as the tide changes during the battle. It's quite a fascinating story. But on the other hand, he says, but all of these British 
uh, officials and generals, they don't actually understand what's going on underneath the surface of the society that they've pretended to rule for all these years. And Wilkie doesn't fully understand it either, but he's trying to sort it out. Um, and in some ways he comes with fresh eyes, naive eyes, but fresh eyes. Um, and so he's trying to say, what do I do with what I'm learning here? And how does it map onto an inchoate and emerging set of possibilities in the United States for transforming all this? Because Americans come to places like Egypt and Sudan, and they are interestingly, and this is something I think we forget about this period, they're interestingly open to new kinds of re relations to the world. They come with all kinds of baggage, racism most profoundly, but also kinds of senses of we're not going to be like the British. The British are stuffy. The British are hoity-toity. The British look down on everyone. All these sort of um, somewhat jingoistic and exceptionalist American ideas, but that Wilkie believes by force of his own personality, he might be able to turn uh, through a kind of, um, through the force of his, 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 uh, the, his following at that point into something new. And so he's, he's working with these opening ideas and they really develop as he goes across uh, from Sudan into Egypt, over to various countries um, uh, along the Mediterranean, right? To starting in Turkey, down to, uh, um, to Beirut, to Palestine, to, um, to Jer through Jerusalem, over to Iraq, to, uh, to, to Tehran, and then, and then away. And he learns a lot across this swath and that's what he tries to take back um, and he tries to he tries to make it so that in 1952 when the United States does intervene in the Suez crisis uh, they might have done so in a very different way but of course his politics as we know fail um, okay so that's that's I guess that's my my uh, brief for for reading more of this Wilkie is not uh, in some sense a He's not, in some sense, an exponent of the kind of anti-imperialist uh, vision uh, that is already cohered, again, in 1919 and before, um, and changing in that interwar period and, and, and transforming and, relate, and, and working through the League of Nations and working with um, other kinds of freedom movements and both uh, you know, armed and, and peaceful movements to try to, um, off to, to get rid of colonialism. But he's learning from that process and hoping to bring it to the United States because it's becoming clear as he travels that the United States is going to have a huge role to play in what will happen to those movements, for better or for ill. Thanks. And Joseph, you also had a question. You had your hand raised. Uh, yes. Uh, good morning, Professor Zipper. Um, I um <clears throat> I have to tell you a little story about the United Nations uh, from a the streets point of view. Nice. Um, uh, I uh, actually uh, was uh, writing a dissertation about the world government movement, and I had an opportunity yeah. to work in the United Nations. Uh, I knew that the UN was not a world government. Right. However, um. I had a very profound experience once I got to First Avenue and uh, looked up the street at all those flags in alphabetical order. You know, the, the flag of the Soviet Union was not too far from the flag of the United States and great, and of uh, the United Kingdom. Uh, and I just uh, was so impressed that uh, however weak the UN was, it did bring together uh, the nations of the of the whole world, and by this point, uh, by the uh, by the mid nineteen eighties, why um, many of the third world countries that uh, Wilkie uh, encount encountered at the time of their search for independence uh, were represented, and their flags were flying along the the this First Avenue. Yeah, um, I must say, uh, I was just thrilled by reading this book. Uh, and I tell you, I was uh, made to laugh at one point when Wilkie was in um, Turkey. Uh, at the time, uh, Turkey was neutral in World War II. Uh, it had been an ally of Germany in War World War I. But there was uh, quite a bit of um, uncertainty about Germany. And in fact, they the Turks feared that the Germans would invade Turkey like they'd invaded Greece. Yeah. Um, so, um, 
<clears throat> Wilkie remarked uh, to some someone that, well, if you'd like to um, find out exactly where Germany stands, why don't you ask Air Hitler to send an emissary from Germany uh, by in the person of the uh, of his opponent in the last election? <laughs> of course, that was a reference to Wilkie himself as a loser in the election of 1940. Mm -hmm. but, um, well, I uh, I wrote a very big book. Uh, you you said that you suspected that E. B. White was just the tip of the iceberg. Yeah, uh, there were many many prominent persons uh, uh, in the United States, and I wrote a whole book called yes. "The Politics of World Federation." Yes, I'm just uh, now I'm just uh, now realizing me. that it's you, Professor Barat. Yes. <laughs> um, but I'd like Great. to ask you a kind of contemporary question. I was uh, struck by uh, the fact that, that your book was published by Harvard University Press. Uh, there was a time in the old days when many Harvard professors uh, were quite articulate about the implications of, of uh, World War II and uh, its need for a stronger form of international organization than the United Nations. Uh, one, one of them was uh, Arthur N. Holcomb. Another was... Uh, Carl Friedrich, and the third was Louis B. Sohn. Uh, Sohn uh, co-authored with Grenville Clark, uh, quite a magnificent book of uh, UN reform called the Poli called uh, World Peace Through World Law. The question is, in uh, your experience in academia there at Brown and probably at Harvard, um, do you sense there's some kind of softening of the opposition to world federal government in academia today? Uh, I find just the most extraordinary contempt for all kinds, all of these ideas ref, uh, reflected in Wilkie's book, uh, also in uh, Henry Wallace's books. Uh, do you sense there's any softening of the opposition to uh, to a world federal thinking, mm. um, yeah, or is it? Uh, or are you quite exceptional? <laughs> well, there's a couple different ways to for that I would answer that from my perspective. First of all, thank you for 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 that question and for reading my book. And I had I had not quite realized that was you on here, <laughs> and that's great. So. Of course, I didn't expect to to come here and see 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 colleagues and people whose books I've read. I, I and I knew that everyone would have expertise, but thank you, um, Joseph. I appreciate your coming and asking about this. Um, so, you know, my perspective on this is that um, that it depends what part of the academy you're in. Um, and as I as I suggested earlier, I start this as a historian and a humanist, and in many ways as a as a kind of interdisciplinary humanist who's interested in less in the kind of formal realm of of uh, international relations than in just the kind of world the, the sort of amorphous world of culture and politics and that's actually why i'm interested in wilkie in a lot of ways because he connects the world of formal politics to people's everyday lives through his through writing a massive bestseller that all kinds of everyday people read and and, and were forced to think about larger questions here so um, you know, my sense is that uh, my sense is that the I don't have a good sense for the landscape of the of the of of the state of thinking in academia in say international relations or the world of um, the 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 place where the places where diplomats are trained at this point. Um, I think there's more room for alternative views of the world at this point. Um, if, you know, my own institution, Brown is a little bit of an outlier on all things like this, but where our school, which soon to be School of International Affairs, the Watson School is a, is a place that is quite interested in particularly stories about uh, the aftermath of colonialism and alternative frames for thinking about, say, development politics and that sort of thing. But to the extent that these places are, are pretty resolutely um, presentist. I think they tend to approach this in uh, a frame of trying to 
develop models for new 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 forms of imaginary, and they kind of leave behind the question uh, of the older the older history. But I do think that there are new model new 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 avenues for thinking beyond that binary that we talked before. Whether that will result in a kind of new constituency for explicitly for world federalism or not, I'm not sure, but maybe for a kind of expanded language around interdependence and co cooperation. I mean, it would seem that that has to happen, right? That that we're just, we've we've run up against the, the um, it seems like we've run up against the uh, the limits of the system that we that we've lived in for so long, several times now over the past what twenty years at least, and all of us know that it, that those we've reached those limits many times before, um, and so we need new forms of thinking. And I, I can't imagine that the kinds of ideas that the World Federalist first advance won't have some influence on that. Whether that will um, lead to a revival of World Federalism, I'm not sure, but. The other thing I think to say is that there's a lot more view of there's a lot more um, variation or let's say opposition to that to to the the status quo let's say outside of schools of international relations so in history departments or in the kinds of departments where I sit there the 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 the, the view of this question is quite different um, and quite um, quite more varied. Uh, it, I think it tends to, and I suggested this earlier, it tends to operate and, and, and collect around a different form of orthodoxy, which is a kind of particular vision of anti-imperialism, um, which I'm fine with and I think is a, an important form of politics. But as a historian, I think uh, I have, it, as I suggested earlier, it's kind of ruled out seeing a whole other set of tradition. So in some sense, the world federalists disappear from our stories of the 1940s because we have a story about um, the rise of the Cold War and the making of internet of, of a kind of liberal Cold War vision and and the the opposition of the right wing to that and and then we also have in my world a story of 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 the 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 rise of a kind of um, bottom up anti imperialism something in some sense that emerges out of anti fascism and emerges out of the long standing anti imperial movements in, in what would in those years come to be called the third world right. Um, that that story is told more and more frequently, but it leaves out this sort of vast middle of people, I think, to, to which we're connected to that story, but we're not sort of maybe in the vanguard of it, let's say, to use the old political terms, who had, and I think, some actual influence for a bit here, and that's the story I hope to tell, in the 1940s. Um, but I'm less clear, and this maybe goes to part of Suzanne's question and to part of what you're talking about, I'm less clear about how this uh, you know, I try to get into this in conclusion. We can talk about that in October, maybe, but uh, about how this, the, the long tail of these questions, but I'm not entirely sure how it exactly works out in organizations. It's more sort of, I was interested in the way that the vision of interdependence resounds through different parts of the culture of the United States in later years. So my sense is that in certain areas of, the, of, of academia now, there's quite a bit of interest in different ways of seeing um, the world, but I'm not sure that it it collects around um, a particular interest in the world federal world federalism as a vision, um, and I don't feel um, expert enough in the history of world federalism as you are to understand exactly how that all falls. But um, but it's a it's a it's a great question, and it's important I think to try to to try to to get new narratives going, and this was my attempt to try to take the narrative that maybe had coalesced around the, the quote unquote failure of world federalism and explain that world federalism was part of a much, a part of a more interesting, perhaps inchoate and amorphous sort of political culture and popular culture around independent in, interdependence. And that's, that's why I got interested in white and other people like that who were not exactly political figures, but were sort of more cultural figures. So Wilkie sits in between those two things in a way for me. Thank you. Thank you. And we, um, Emma, before we head over to you, we do have a, a question in the in the chat that's been sitting there for a while. My apologies. Um, Sandy, do you have any comments on what Wilkie might say about Article 108 and 109 of the UN Charter? That's a, that's a question that I said. I thought to myself, so I don't really know what that is. And so I need someone to explain it to me. This is this is the bread and butter of you all. And the kind of thing that I uh, find in a, a you know an article once or twice and like oh yeah we get to know that and then forget so 
um, in my many different worlds. So if, if someone, if you would like to explain that to me, I would be happy to 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 venture some guesses about that. I'm forgetting what that is. Actually, I think um, William, you're more than. I mean, you were yeah, knee deep in this. Right, I know Rebecca was too. Oh, thank you. Yeah, no, it's all about uh, how to reform the UN Charter. Oh, okay. Uh, one one the 108 is uh, first talks about that it can maybe happen. Um, I think they had 10 year period uh, after the 1945. Uh, oh, I but see. Then 109 is actually the process for it to begin again uh, okay. without uh, without the, the in, within any time. Okay, got it. I understand now. Yeah. And Rebecca, did you want to help me a little more with that? <laughs> sure. Yeah. No, exactly as William said, that this was the process for a view that was baked into the charter, that this oh, was meant to be a living document. Yeah. Um, I included in the chat that um, that famous quote by by Truman at the UN Charter Conference, oh, yeah, um, right. about not being preserved in ember, not being poured into a mold. Um, and so no later than the 10th uh, session of the United Nations, the charter was supposed to be opened up, and of course that hasn't happened. Um, and when we get to the summit of the future a little bit later, I can talk about the UN charter reform efforts that are um, civil society led, um, at which CGS will be um, speaking um, along with our friends and colleagues um, in just a week's time. Um, Great. But thanks so much. Okay, yeah. I So I feel like this is sort of October's uh, subject because it gets to the end of the book where Wilkie is kind of in in the last few, I don't know, six, eight months of his life, right? He dies in October of 1944, spoiler alert. Um, and so is not actually uh is not actually um a lot when the when you know all these when Article 108 and 109 are finalized and when they come to public, when everyone begins to understand what is actually going on with you in turn. But he is aware of uh, vaguely, and it's hard to tell from the available archival record how aware he is and what level of knowledge he has of the way that the um, planning for the UN is taking place behind the scenes in the State Department, in the Roosevelt administration, and the other places that uh, the, the, the kind of exclusive and sort of narrowed form of the UN is being shaped. And he said throughout, um, and you'll see, and I don't have the exact quote, but it's sort of at the in the last Oh, what chapter is this in? The Narrows of 1944, which I think is chapter uh, nine or 10 of the book, 10 or 11, um, chapter 12 of the book. He, he talks about, he's making, he makes a big case in, in 1943 and 44, and particularly in 44, uh, before, he be, before he takes sick and, and, and passes away, uh, that he wants to see a, um, a council of all the nations, right? He knows already that that the um, that the UN is being organized with a view towards what you know FDR called the four policemen, uh, with with the control of what will eventually become the Security Council over the power of the secure uh, excuse me of the General Assembly, what will become the General Assembly, and he wants to continue to push for a, a more democratic form for it. So I think he would uh, um, have. So that's one thing to say, right? Is that he is he's trying to weigh in on an evolving debate that even comes before the idea that the UN Charter is something that needs to be flexible and plastic rather than set in stone. He's trying to get it, to, he's trying to head off a situation in which it takes the shape it, it does in the beginning. So I would imagine that uh, once he, uh, if had he lived, he probably would have been quite in favor of seeing, uh, opening up the UN Charter again because it hadn't lived up to the vision that he hoped to see for it. Um, there's another set of questions here, which have to do with whether Wilkie would have continued in this mode of open and internationalism, or whether he, whether he would have fallen back into a kind of more uh, traditional Cold War liberalism. I'm going to leave that off the table, and we can talk about that in October. So that's the end of the book. Um, but that's that's one thing. So let, let's move on. I think uh, Emma's been, been been waiting. Yes, Emma, please. Oh wow! Well, thank thank you, Sandy. Uh, for introducing us to your book. Uh, in full disclosure, I haven't read it, but I was motivated to be here. I uh, want to um, continue and deepen this conversation around books because I think um, uh, this is really an important outlet for us to, to come together. So um, allow me to, to, to preface a few things uh, and then ask a question. 
uh, earlier today, I, I stumbled across a video from uh, a lady called um, Crystal Asegi. She's a senator um, in Kenya. She opened a talk she gave by saying, if, you, if all you see is what you see, then you have not seen all that there is to see. Uh, I, I, I say this quote to say that uh, first, uh, just in what I've learned and, and, and heard from others today, the world as was conceived at the end of uh, World War II uh, did not contemplate a world where there was the possibility of a one world where Africa in particular was uh, and not submitted as a subject to some of its larger uh, legal apparatus and so forth. So I wanna put that out there um, because as we think ahead uh, on what your book is hoping to achieve and what we have today, I think there's, a, there's still a lot to be done and I'll be curious as to what you think the uh, hero of your book, uh, Wendell Wilkins, would think? Yeah, but I mean, to my, right. <laughs> but to my more substantive um, question here, the concept of exceptionalism, right? As we think of America, idealism and nationalism. In in your book, which I've only glanced at, you reference narrow nationalism. I would argue that it is more selective nationalism, and we can have a discussion around this. So America did not really participate in the colonialism of Africa. It, it was all too happy, in my view, to outsource that, right? So we see having succeeded in uh, as part of the Allied forces in bringing what one would describe as peace, it literally fell back on the selective nationalism and was all too happy to see its allies really sink deep into the in, into colonialism, which still remains today. Uh, case in point, uh, post World War II, you see Algeria having fought on the side of the Allied, now fighting for its independence. This narrow or what I call selective nationalism, America sat back and saw the slaughter in North Africa as as countries were desperately trying to gain independence. We see that in Sub-Saharan Africa today, where again, through this selective nationalism, uh, America is all too happy to outsource that to its partner, particularly France, to decimate vast swaths of the continent, particularly in Sub-Saharan Africa. So my question is, what would Wendell say today if he were still around that would explain the strong tendency to which still is today to turn inward or even when we do turn outward we we have the selective nationalism and we see that in ukraine we see that whether it's for a particular interest in in asia but not around the world so Leading up to the summit of uh, uh, summit of the future, I see that the world as was conceived post this win for the ally is still far from re from a reality. Yeah, thank you, Emma, for that question. I think you you've put your finger on on the the dilemma that confronted Wilkie right at, as he traveled around the world, which was that the United States. And the word you've used, selective, is just right. Uh, so the United States had this kind of um, both inward-turned view of itself and a sense that it could uh, be interested in the world where it thought it was necessary, where it thought it was only in its own interests. Um, and Wilkie's hope was that you could, uh, that the United States should be capacious enough uh, to expand its view of the world, but not to try to dominate the world, but to cooperate with it. And I think that that is, for me, that was the kind of kernel of a an alternative conception of the world that was possible in Wilkie's vision, 
uh, and lost in all the ways that you know so well and you've just laid out for us so nicely, right? In the sense that in so many places around the world, um, you know, the the Africa is a, is is an obvious example as you as you laid out, um, and and I think the United States in some sense just kind of ignored what happened in Africa. It wasn't that important to the United States, but in, even in places where it was important, like Vietnam, um, they also allowed, of course, the French to take over that with long term consequences that were quite tragic for the people of Vietnam and for the United States. And so in continuing, right, that you, you're showing how in Africa, that's the same thing we're dealing with. We're dealing with the same sets of compounding tragedies because of some of these decisions. Wilkie, I don't think he foresaw this necessarily. He wasn't some great seer. I think what he was was somebody who was sensing uh, uh, inchoately the possibility of, of changing the direction of things as they had been um, with the hope that they would open up onto some kind of more uh more equitable future and, and so when it comes to so so he saw this right his view was in that sense quite global in the sense that he wanted to do it in a universalistic way right and i i was just gonna as you were talking about the quote you'd seen about uh we only see what we see and we don't see everything right that's in some sense what he was trying to do is reorient our seeing and so for those of you who have been through the book um in the in, in the images uh that i uh that I have in the book. One of the most interesting is always to me has been this image that is was used in the book itself, in, in, um, in One World itself, in various editions of it. This is on page 112, um, is this view of the globe that was published in One World um, and imagines the world uh, transformed as a borderless place, a place connected only by the, as I say in the part somewhere in the book, the vector of Wilkie's journey as the kind of connective thing that Americans might might see that the world remade in that way. But the tension, of course, here, and I don't think Wilkie was able to figure this out, and he didn't overcome this, was that if you see the world in a universalist way, you're going to apply the same uh, view to everything, and then you're going to miss things in their particularities. And so I think that Wilkie's this worked in some places where he was able to see the particulars, but he didn't really see them in Africa. I think Africa for him was a kind of place that he quickly jumped, that he felt he, he went through. Egypt made an impression on him, but of course the politics of Egypt were quite different than the politics of sub-Saharan Africa. The Sudan, I don't think, meant a lot to him. It was a stopover. It was the beginning of the trip. It wasn't quite, he wasn't quite there. So we struggle with this sense, I think, and many of you will have struggled with this before, right? It's the sense that we can have a universalist one world vision, but that doesn't equip us to always understand the particularities of places um, where we've had particular kinds of imperial interests that are leading to, to unequal outcomes. So I think Wilkie struggled with that as well. Thank you. Um, so we have time for um, any other questions or comments or a second round. So if anyone has any other comments and questions. I, I just have a follow up uh, and this is for every everybody, including you, Sandy. Um, is it idealistic to think of a one world? Um, when the preambles have not really been in place. And here I'm struggling with the concept of um, how we govern and how we see ourselves, right? Um, should this really uh, be something that is taught in schools so that uh, at the heart of it, we root out a certain thinking so that, uh, as I said in my quote, borrowing from uh, Crystal, if you think you've seen, you just haven't seen enough. So um, I, I sit sometimes and I wonder the idealistic and lofty nature of a one world, which is laudable, but whether we, we, we really still need to put the um, preliminaries in place and how that would occur. Because uh, as I think, and look forward to reading your book. Uh, I wish I had before coming here because it's always an uh, an honor to to have the author. You just don't do that, have that all the time. Um, well, I'll be back in a month, so you have a, you have a month to <laughs> dive in. <laughs> yeah, 
to see a, um, a someone put out a vision that is uh, timely, even uh, 60, 70 years later, and would be in the future, and, and to see people in, in contemporarily trying to implement that, and you wonder really what is making it not work so well and why should it even take long? Mm -hmm. Since deep in our souls, we feel that it's the right thing to do. What is what is it that holds back the vision of someone like Wendell from uh, coming into fruition, uh, even when we have learned from all the mistakes? Mm -hmm. I don't know if I'm I'm just uh, having a a word word salad here or not? <laughs> no, no, no. You're articulating a real dilemma that I came to at the end of this book and wasn't sure quite how to resolve. Um, and so, you know, I'll, I'll say, and this is, you know, perhaps not uh, the, the best audience for this admission, uh, but I'm not sure I was fully convinced by Wilkie's idealism either. Um, and I think it has something to do, and, and that's not because I don't admire it, and I don't think it's um, a, a, a powerful vision for the form of a world we might want. Um, but I also think that it, I guess I, I would put the, the kernel of my ambivalence here, not my doubts or my criticisms or my um, sort of, you know, my, I, I, the book is not about taking down Wendell Wilkie. It's not about showing a different world. It's about in, trying to understand the, uh, the questions and problems that he raises. And one of them is exactly what you said just now, which is, can this vision be realized if we if we don't all, if, if there's not already a kind of, um, I'm not quite sure how you said it, but the precedents are in place. If people don't already, if we don't already have a groundswell of people to believe in this. It's a very difficult thing. And I know that this is, this is something that all of you must struggle with all the time. And that folks who are interested in global connections of various sorts for years have struggled with this, how to convince people, right? How to get people to have the same feeling about this that you do. Um, and Wilkie struggled with that too. And there's a, a what you said made me think of some of the ways that Wilkie's vision was um, was sort of criticized uh, by uh, by more kind of um, more kind of uh, skeptical or cynical thinkers in that period, and and that's not to say that what you're saying is skepticism or cynicism, but you're saying how do we create the how do we create the um, groundswell of support for this? And this is exactly what the the theologian Reinhold Niebuhr, who is a very well known um, liberal theologian in these years, many of you will remember him. He uh, remember his his thinking, right? He was very influential, recently influential, I suppose, on Barack Obama. He said, um, but who began as a kind of a pacifist in the 1920s and 30s, and then by the time he it, the the beginning of of the Cold War, he had become a kind of Cold War liberal, right? Um, and his crit criticism of um, Wilkie was, and this is on page 278, uh, was that uh, world political union would only arise when humanity itself had truly superseded the power politics practiced by the children of darkness and found an actual world community. And Niebuhr was never sure how that would ever happen. Um, so in a way, this is a cynical take on, on Wilkie's influence, right? Because it, it simply says, oh, this, we, we can't even think about this until everybody agrees with us. Well, that's not a solution. We have to figure out, and we have to figure out, and Wilkie would have said uh, in response to this, would, would he, had he been able to respond to it, was to say, no, we have to work to find a way to get people to under, to feel this. And this is Wil what Wilkie tried to do. So to turn back to, to what Wilkie was really trying to do is he was trying to um, explain to every uh, explain is the wrong word because he didn't do it in a kind of legalistic or even logical manner all the time he just tried to get people to feel that they were all connected to one another right this was his idea and this is part of what i try to what i try to uh explain in the book my wife this morning said that you should see wilkie as a kind of mid-century influencer right somebody who's trying to put their ideas out there in the world and it, using the technology of the day to make people feel they're connected in some sort of way. And that's just exactly right. Whatever we feel about the um, influence of social media on our contemporary politics and our contemporary things, and I'll, I'll leave that off the page for now. But um, one of the threads that I bring forward in my book is, this, is, is, is Wilkie as a kind of chief figure of what I call the age of broadcasting, 
somebody who is able to put himself out in the world uh, in, in a way that he embodies a spirit of connectivity that everybody is starting to feel. And that he says, as he goes around the world, he feels people feeling too. And he wants people to understand that uh, this is the kind of connective energy that could, that could blossom over time into a spirit that would uh, get everyone to be in the same place that, that you all are in, uh, of, of needing to feel these connections and to have those overwhelm the other, uh, the feelings of narrow and selective nationalism, right? That you that you you so aptly highlighted, Emma. And that I think is the, it's it's the interesting thing about Wilkie. It's also the tough thing about Wilkie because those are very fraught things to try and do. And trying to do things at the level of public opinion of that sort, they can break lots of different ways. As we know, um, doing trying to make this work can can lead in many different ways and lots of people have feelings about lots of things and the other side of this just to see uh we know the the, the far other side of these politics uh, exemplified by all of our our bet noir these days right our, our our um our ugly friend who we hope shall not ascend again to the presidency that's all based on feelings too right that's all based on feelings of of, of, of nationalism nationalism is rooted as we all know, in all kinds of feelings as well. So it, it it's not a simple politics, um, and that's the another ambivalence that I that I track in the book. And Joseph, I think you had your your hand up. Did you have uh, another? Simon, Simon had a question. Oh, thank you, Simon. Yes, uh, thank you very much uh, for the uh, people who have contributed. Uh, in this morning uh, to a, uh, an ideal world, one world. Uh, coming to the current situation that we've got in the United Nations and the Security Council, where one of the members of the Security Council is, is opposed to a, an idea, it could be blocked completely uh, from taking place or cooperating. Uh, what are your thoughts about changing the Security Council's uh, uh, situation so that there is unanimity without one person in the world of 8 billion people being able to block it. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I feel a little on unsure ground here because I, uh, as I've said before, I don't under, I don't know, as you all do intimately, the structures and histories of, of the attempts to reform the United Nations and the, uh, the various ways that have been um, offered for that, uh, offered or envisioned for that. But I do think that, um, you know, looking at this history, um, this is the kind of the story of, of one world and of Wilkie's vision of it is one that um, was trying to offset to trying to un trying to avoid a world where four great powers, five great powers eventually had the ability to um, to thwart any uh, any attempt by uh, by groups of people or national groups or other groups who were who had less power in the world or in world organization to to try to win public influence, win global influence for their ideas, right? For Wilkie, the idea was to have a world body that um, that could allow forms of uh, alternative visions for performing world relations to come to the fore. Right, that was really his view, and I think that um, because he never saw the Security Council as it was eventually constituted in 1944 and 1945, I think he uh, didn't have a chance to weigh in on that. But I do think that what we can take from his view of the world uh, and it, what he learned in this period was a sense that the that the world should the, the, the this future world body. Uh, which was still in in, in its uh, embryo form when he was still writing, should be constituted in such a way that um, there was not a group of four or five great powers sitting at the top of this. It was to get away from that constitution of of, of the world. And so I think that um, we can continue to 
imagined forms of world relation that, that destabilize that. I, you know, I think it was hard to say for me, you know, given that we do have this, this power and that, that we have so, we're, we're sort of living with this sclerotic form that in some ways carries over from the early 20th century or carries over even from the 19th century when a certain group of nations have been sort of now artificially, in, you know, kind of, I don't know what, uh, glued to the top of the world hierarchy, we might find another way to imagine it that would allow this to happen. I see someone waving to say something, so that, please, please, help me out here. <laughs> Did someone have a, a comment think, on that? I think William you know, I was, wanted to was thank uh, Dr. Zip. P. You're hitting the nail right on the head right now. This is this is uh, definitely a conversation that, that we wanted to hear um, today and, and really, uh, we know that it's been going on a long time, but how how we change and and getting us involved is really it really what you've done a, a good job on. Thank you very much. Well, thank you. I appreciate that. I, I'm 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 always worried when I talk to you folks that um that that you know you all are have been following this in such detail for so long and know the ins and outs of all these things that I'm I'm, I'm a little more hazy on. Uh, but I'm glad to hear that the history of that this story of opening up a slightly different history than we have is useful. And, you know, I'm often asked, you know, what what would Wilkie do today? And, I, you know, that, that's always hard for a historian to answer because we're so ensconced in the context and the contingencies of the of the moment. Um, that's important to us professionally and, and kind of, I think, ethically to be able to only to, to see only past a certain point. But I, but I do think that part of the, my book, and we'll, we can return this, to this in October too, because it's the the back the back half of the book, the very last part of the book, is to is to suggest that there are buried resources in the story of Wilkie for our own imaginations of of, of going forward. Um, well, absolutely, and, and talking about. absolutely, and 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 with the UN uh, General Assembly Assembly seventy nine already initiated and started for this year. Uh, it's the time is right. The time yeah. is right now. Yeah. yeah, I think that we're approaching a period in global history where a lot is going to change. And it's this is the sorts of things that we need to that we need to keep thinking about to try to push forward some very concrete changes. I mean, the thing that it was was always comp hard about re about writing about Wilkie and thinking about the present is that there are so many new challenges that Wilkie doesn't quite equip us to face. And I'm not, again, I'm not an expert on all these, but I think most profoundly, of course, of climate change, which um, climate change is, you know, to, to simplify it a little bit, and maybe you all have different a take on this than I do, but um, climate, climate change is in some sense not a global problem, of course it is, it's also a planetary problem, right? It asks us to think about the relations between us and the, the non-human world surrounding us. Um, and that's a problem that Wil Wilkie was not even close to understanding or thinking. Not surprisingly, right? It was a there were very few people who who would have thought about it. ecologists to some extent who were thinking in those terms back then. Uh, but but uh, that was those you know as far as I know those um, those kinds of histories perhaps had not yet to be joined up, and they certainly didn't have a, a say on the world stage in a way that they do now uh, to some extent. Um, and, and we struggle to, to, to bring a more planetary view to the, um, and, and a view that understands the, the global production of uneven development through empire and colonialism that, that will help us to, to actually address these planetary problems in, in a really equitable way, rather than one that just works for, for the global North, right? That's, that's the set of struggles that I think weren't even broached, or one set of struggles that weren't even broached for Wilkie, and 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 you know, perhaps leave some people also a little less, uh, oh, I don't know, perhaps interested in the the history of one world and the one world idea because it it feels too universalist to people. It feels like it's just a, a kind of one size fits all block. And I talk about bit about that in the book, and um, but I don't think that that ends the story. I think there's lots of ways to 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 carry forward in in, in a vision that we would feel helps us to, to deal with these problems. And with that lovely note to end on, um, we have, we I have, think we have Carla who is interested in getting in. Do you want to? Carla, Carla, sorry, I didn't. <laughs> thank you so much, Carla. Please. Just a question, quickly, Sandy. Are you yeah. familiar with the publication, the um, the the um, 
Constitution for the Federation of Earth. Are you, are you familiar I, I, with that? I'm not familiar with it. I think I've heard okay. of it, but I'm not familiar with it. All right. Yeah. It's available. I know maybe Drea can send you a copy or okay. it's available from Amazon. We have mm -hmm. studied that extensively in this group. Mm -hmm. And I think it would be quite a revelation to see that the entire constitution for the UN has already been written. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, yeah, there's been so, such an interesting history uh, and this was true of this period too, right? Where lots of people, Wilkie never really did this. He never really um, tried to formalize his views. Um, but there were so many people, as you all know, and, and Joseph knows quite well, who were cooking up alternative versions of the UN throughout the 1940s and picking up on different things. And I, I touch on this a bit in the book, but it, you know, this is the kind of thing that the, the sort of civil society efforts to, to rewrite these worlds you all know all about that was also happening in the 40s and Wilkie was not formally a part of, but he was interested in pushing those problems to the, of, to the front of public dialogue. And he somehow managed for a time to kind of embody this inchoate and very interesting and very um, productive challenge that d documents like that, uh, I'm sure, are, 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 are um, trying to put forward now. When was that written, the Constitution for the Federation of the Earth? Was that a recent document, or is that something that came in an earlier moment? 1985, wasn't it? 85, okay. Yeah. Who's who's behind that? Who are the people who, who, who worked on that? Well, no representatives of the people convening in constitutional convention mm -hmm. is Philip Isley and his friends. Philip Isley, right. Okay, that's a name that I've heard, but I don't know much about. Yeah. I mean, it's interesting the way that Wilkie's view of the of one world echoes down through time. And this is not, I wish I had known about that document when I wrote the book, because then I could have, it's probably a way that one world the, the one world ideals kind of bubble up to the surface again and are taken up and reconstituted in these new forms. I, I talk about a much more inchoate sense, or sort of more, um, I'm using that word a lot today, but a lot of, of ones that are, uh, you know, just much more sort of generalized, like the environmental movement, right? In this kind of general way, which obviously informs something like a constitution for the Federation of the Earth, right? That's that planetary view that is, that is um, one world plus environmentalism, I would imagine, you know, so that's a, and plus, uh, you know, one world plus decolonization plus environmentalism, right, that kind of, to, to be overly schematic about it, right, that's the, that's the way that I, that I think one world lives on. Oh, fantastic, and I think with that, um, we are a little bit behind, but I think it would be really helpful, um, Rebecca, if you talk a little bit about some of the future, I know that's, of everyone's minds, and I want to send the um, link in the chat for the invite for, for the events coming up. Absolutely, and I tried, but I was a little bit too slow to find an accessible um, resource on um, uh, the People's World Constitution. But we can we can follow with that, and and maybe Drea will be a better researcher quicker than I, at least. Um, thank you all so much. This could not be, I think, a more fitting moment to have this discussion um, as we are on the precipice of the Summit of the Future next week, which has been hailed, um, and I don't think hyperbolically, um, as a once-in-a-generation gener opportunity for UN reform. And I apologize for those of you who have heard me talk about this now ad infinitum, ad nauseum. Um, but the Summit of the Future was envisioned by Secretary General uh, Guterres, um, more or less as a swan song, um, as an opportunity to come together for active commitments by member states to advance um, across an array, really the whole galaxy um, of global issues that confront us today. And there are three main outcome documents, a pact for the future and two annexes, a declaration on future generations and a global digital compact. And the pact for the future, um, which is now I believe in its final draft, unless we see anything very unusual happening over the next week um, before the summit, um, which was uh, the most recent was uh, leaked this morning, uh, contemplates five main areas, um, financing and sustainable development, um, peace and security, 
um, the uh, cooperation on digital um, uh, governance and science, um, the rights of uh, youth and future generations, and global governance reform. And in each of these areas, civil society over the course of the time since the summit was announced two years ago, and this SDG summit, the Sustainable Development Goals Summit last year, um, has been animating to try to have some ambitious proposals, um, as well as some very acutely actionable proposals and items um, that can come out of the summit. And to this end, we there was a civil society conference in Nairobi in May, where approximately two dozen impact, so-called impact coalitions um, coalesced, one of them being uh, what you see behind me, you can't quite make out the full title, but Just Institutions in the International Court of Justice. And each of these impact coalitions, along with other civil society actors, including the major groups and other stakeholders, um, and those who have access to the UN system heretofore, and those who have not, um, will be coming together next week, right before the summit, for two so-called action days, um, during which there will be a whole variety of events um, embarking on discussions um, and, and hopefully active um, strategizing um, around areas of reform. And so what I hope uh, Drea is, yeah, putting in the chat all of the info on the action days um, and um, on some of the events that I'll now highlight that CGS in particular um, is leading on. And at one point we were also joined on this call, although I don't see her anymore, uh, by the wonderful communications officer for the Coalition for the UN We Need, which has really been um, the uh, the glue um, and the catalyst and the organizer nexus um, behind most of the civil society organization around the summit of the future. So the flyer that Jaya, um, I hope we'll be able to, sh yep, just share with you, for which there's one correction that I will make. Um, I includes um, several events on which um, CGS either leads or supports. And um, some of these, the juxtaposition, I think, um, is a really fitting counterpoint to the tension of, of Wilkie's idealism and um, maybe even worse than cynicism and maybe fatalism. Um, I found this quote, Sandy, and I hope you won't tell me that this is apocryphal and this is not a Wilkie quote, um, but that I would rather lose in a cause that I know someday will triumph than to triumph in a cause that I know someday will fail. That seems to be a very fitting um, sentiment that to, um, where a lot of our heads and hearts um, um, are at leading up to this summit um, and what we hope to get out of it. Um, I will start, I guess, by uh, juxtaposing two events that I'm speaking at, um, at one of the, the big conference rooms. Um, just an hour apart from each other. And this one is where the, we need to make a correction to the flyer because Room for Optimism is actually on September 21st um, at 1 p.m., not on September 23rd. But we'll send this all around to everybody who, who's in this, uh, this uh, meeting, um, as well as all of our dear CGS friends. Um, we have two companion um, sessions, one right before the other. One will be a very critical analysis of the lacunae within the Pact for the Future and the recommendations that are coming out of these impact coalitions. Um, and specifically, impact coalitions on inclusive gov global governance, which will touch on the UN Parliamentary Assembly um, proposal that many of you are very, very well familiar with, as well as a Global Citizens Assembly proposal. Um, uh, secondly, I think secondly, um, the Earth Governance um, Coalition, which will um, talk about the declaration of a planetary emergency, which harkens back to something that Sandy was uh, saying just a short while ago about looking at these challenges as planetary challenges, not just challenges for humanity. Um, I'll, I will be speaking on um, our international justice architecture and what needs to be buttressed um, and um, supplemented to realize the promise of never again and the hope for all humanity that we look to our judicial institutions at the global level um, to, to realize and where they, of course, have, have fallen short. Um, and we will end up with the coalition on UN charter reform. Um, and here uh, there is a policy paper that's currently under embargo, but I will share with everybody as, as soon as humanly possible, 
on what it would actually take to invoke Article 109. And this includes the case for updating the UN Charter. I um, know we would be preaching to the choir in that regards, but suggested steps to call the General Conference to review. The reforms that could emerge from updating the Charter, responses to concerns generally raised about updating the Charter at this time. Um, and then um, suggested language and elements for the General Assembly resolution itself. So very concrete, giving a playbook to states, this is how you can take this forward. This doesn't need to be um, this bugaboo specter that we're so afraid of opening up the charter when in fact it's baked into the charter itself. So that was a little bit about some of the events um, on uh, one of the action days. There is also, um, and I believe this is hybrid. I am now having trouble opening that. Yes, it is. Um, uh, right before the, the official action day is a full day spent on the launch of a report on a second UN charter um, that is led by one of CGS's dear friends and a former speaker at our book club, Augusto Lopez Claros, um, inter alia. Um, and what I really hope that everybody tunes in for um, is um, our uh, day uh, one action day event um, that you'll see the whole first page of this um, uh, uh, flyer um, is dedicated to um, where we will be looking in more intimate detail at, at judicial systems. Um, and for, we'll be joined for the first time um, at a CGS event, I believe, um, by a representative of the International Criminal Court. Um, where I said that there was this juxtaposition is one of the events that we are going to close out with um, at CGS, where I'll be speaking, is on room for optimism. And so here, I think that's where you have that tension between the idealism and the more cynical or realism, um, depending on the way you, you want to look at it, um, that we've been talking about in terms of Wilkie's legacy. And so I've been thinking a lot about what I'm gonna say there, um, especially coming out of um, some of the more critical analysis of the Pact for the Future and now looking with um, um, a little bit of a jaundiced eye at the latest Pact for the Future draft. Um, and what I think that I have to say to some extent um, in, in using that Kofi Annan language uh, that was about the ICC, but could really be about this whole project of global governance of a hope for all humanity, is that if there is to be a hope for all humanity, humanity has to have hope. Um, and so I've said before that I'm contractually obligated to be an optimist, and hopefully that's what we'll <laughs> remarks next week. So we hope you tune in. I know it's a whole lot of stuff, but um, um, well, I would love to see some of you there um, virtually and a couple of you in person. So very delighted um, for those of you that are able to join in New York. Apologies have gone on too long. And um, there was a wonderful uh, discussion in the chat about the, the veto um, specifically. This is something that um, an upcoming discussion with Professor Jennifer Trahan will focus on. And um, if I hadn't exceeded my time, I, I would speak about it a little bit more. If anyone wants to hang on with me for me to be a legal geek, um, I could do that. But I don't, I don't know that that's how you want to spend the rest of your Saturday. Thank you, Drea. That, that, that's all for me, truly. <laughs> thank you so much, Rebecca. And thank you, Sandy. This has just been so wonderful. I love these deep dives. I love these discussions. Thank you everyone for your brilliant questions and comments. Uh, just a reminder, next month we are meeting same time, same place. Um, I believe that's, hold on, let me open up my calendar, October 12th, 12, 12, yeah. where we will wrap up this uh, book and session. So bring your questions again. And, and uh, I've put in the chat as well, the schedule for the rest of the year that also includes uh, Jennifer Trahan, and we'll have a really um, invigorating conversation on the Security Council and the veto power uh, for January and February. And of course, Winston is here. Thank you, Winston, for being part of Book Club. And you will be, uh, we will be with you for your book for Abolishing War for November and December. Cool. Uh, so we are over time. Thank you, everyone. We hope to see you for uh, the uh, hybrid events next week for the side events. If you can't attend in person, uh, we're trying to make it as accessible as possible and have a good, good Saturday. And we'll see you next month. Thank you, everybody. Thanks, everybody. I appreciate Thank your you. coming. Thank see you, you next Thank month, you. hopefully. Everyone. Yeah.